Amen. You know, yesterday as I was uh, putting on some finishing touches uh, for the message this morning, I just took a break to spend some time in prayer. And I always like to read a psalm before I pray. And yesterday's psalm, next in line, was Psalm 111. And I read these words. Praise the Lord. The psalmist said, I will thank him with all of my heart as I meet with his godly people. And I begin to think about you this morning as we come together as the people of God, the family of God, to know that the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords is here with us because he said, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of you also. And it just uh, was like an overflowing well as I begin to think about the dynamic this morning, the people of God with Jesus, the host of all hosts, who sits enthroned in the praises of his people. No wonder David could say, hate the Lord. I will give thanks with all of my heart as I meet with his godly people. Do you thank God for the body of Christ this morning? Do you thank God for your brothers and sisters? Do you thank God for our destiny as the family of God today? And that we gather to encourage each other and to pray for one another. And to know that he said that where two or three are gathered together in your name, there I am in the midst of you. And if any two of you shall agree as touching anything that they shall ask, it will be done for you, for them, by my Father in heaven. You know, as you look at the requests that are before us, we are praying for Carmen and Jill and Ryan and believing God as she goes through chemotherapy and immunotherapy. And we're just believing the Lord for a great and awesome miracle that nobody can get the credit for but God. Amen. That only the Lord has done that great thing. And so we join together today, putting our faith with their standing together. As we pray for these that are on the screen, many are there that uh, are still fighting different needs like Margaret and others, and then some are not there been some deaths this week in our church. Let's pray for comfort. Let's pray for strength. And if you're comfortable doing this, would you lay your hand on the of the person nearest you? And would you begin to pray for them and pray for their needs? Pray to get for these needs in the family of God. Heavenly Father, I just pray this morning. Let's pray, church. This is a golden opportunity. Let's pray, church to see God move and to see him heal. Father, in the name of Jesus, we do not limit you this morning. We do not doubt in our hearts. We don't come to you with a lack of expectation that you are here and that you hear and you answer us when we pray. Lord, whether it's a marriage that needs to be healed, a body that needs to be healed, whether it's someone that we need to go forgive and we need the strength to face a confrontation or we need a financial miracle. You are the God of protection and provision. You're the God who is our peace. We declare you over this congregation. We declare you over every need in this place today. And I'm asking you, Lord, to come down in a mighty way with acts of kindness and greatness and power and healing and strength, whatever we may need in our lives, in our families, in our church. God, we believe you. We trust you today in this service. We're believing you. Lord, we thank you for healing and we thank you for Carmen and her family and we thank you, Lord, for Margaret and we thank you, Lord, for that that you're doing in little Jalen's life. We thank you, Lord, today for all of these needs that are being met. 
comforting and strengthening and encouraging today. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Lord, we just want to know that we've been touched by you and we know when we've been touched by you, we'll never be the same. We'll leave differently than we came into your presence and we bless you for that and thank you for that. Would you just lift your hands one more time like David and just say thank you, Lord. Today and receive prayer. Receive prayer and receive encouragement. Lord, we thank you for the body of Christ. We thank you, Lord, that you're here with us. And we bless you and praise you in Jesus' name. And amen. And you may be seated. It's good to have all of you today. If you're a guest with us, so glad that you're with us in this service today. Thank you so very much for being with us in church. Uh, thank you for giving. God is blessing. It's blessing you to be a blessing. And that's what it's all about. I was... Uh, in a World Missions Board meeting Tuesday of last week. And we were, we just almost stopped that agenda and started having revival. We started hearing testimonies of what God is doing in great miracles and mighty power that were verified, not that we should doubt, but they were verified. And then we got to talking about how God provides when we give. That He gives to us so that we can give at the cycle of sufficiency just keeps all right on going. You can't outgive God, we say, and you really can. So thank you for tithing and giving in the ministries of our church so that we can be a blessing to the world, our community, equipping and discipling our people here as well. And also, you know, I don't know, I, I, I guess we can get too busy. I don't like to see busy. I don't like to see the church as busy. I like to see us as productive, fruitful. And uh, I think that that's what our ministries here are about. It's not just to keep us busy, but it's to meet need. And so as you view these video announcements today, uh, let's get involved. Every service is important. Wednesday and life groups and kids ministry and, and these worship services and the special events that we have get plugged in where you're gifted and called in these special ministries and god will bless you to be a blessing amen good morning and welcome to father your church of god we are so thankful you have decided to worship with us if you're a guest with us today we are so glad you're here for us church is much more than just a sunday service and we want you to feel at home here one of the best ways to get connected is to fill out the connect card on the queue in front of you, scan the QR code on the back of the bulletin you just received, or visit our webpage at valleychurch.org and click connect at the top right corner. After the service, take the card to the Welcome Center so we can give you a small token of our appreciation. We look forward to seeing you at the next service. Ladies, Friday night and Saturday, March 4th and 5th, is our Women's Conference in Tifton. Pick up your registration form at the Welcome Center and make sure Sister Kim has it back today with your $40 deposit. Sunday, March 6th is World Mission Emphasis Day. Dr. Tom Grisano with Urban Harvest Ministries will be our special guest for the day. At 9.30, all adults are invited to meet in the Smith Center to hear how Urban Harvest is ministering around the world. Dr. Grisano will then be preaching in the morning service Join us for World Mission Emphasis Sunday, March the 6th. You can stay up to date with all of our church events by following our social media platforms. Now you know some of the happenings here at the Vidalia Church. We invite you to become a part of what God is doing here. Should you need Pastor Merritt or the staff, just give us a call. Our phone numbers are listed in your bulletin. Have a great week and we'll see you at the next service. If you would, why don't you stand with us again?
to see that breakthrough we have to go through some refining if the altars where you meet us take me there take me there if you're looking for an offering it's right here my life is here help me
best this morning. Lord, you're worthy of worship that spirit and truth today. And we just lift our hands and honor you and glorify. We bow in our hearts to worship, to adore you. Lord, in this way, may we truly exalt you above everybody, everything else in our lives and give you the praise and the adoration that you alone deserve and we give you glory in Jesus name amen and amen turn around and greet some people would you before you're seated praise the Lord good to be in his house this morning in this worship service today I'm preaching uh, fire falling from heaven this morning. And pray with me, would you please? Father, we just thank you today for the word of the living God. We thank you for what the fire of God means in our lives and in our worlds, in our world. And I pray just move as only you can to do that work that only you can do. Help us to be open and receptive to your word today. And we'll thank you for it and praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Have you ever considered just how powerful and effective prayer is? Have you ever considered that your prayers are fire falling from heaven? Well, that's exactly what John, we call him the revelator, when he was given the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ and wrote 
the vision that he saw in the book of Revelation, that's exactly what he saw in Revelation chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. And I want us to look at those passages together because God's got a message for us right here today about how powerful and effective prayer really is in our lives. And John writes in Revelation 8 and 3, another angel who had a golden censer came and stood at the altar and he was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne and the smoke of the incense together with the prayers of the saints went up before God from the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar and hurled it on the earth. And there came peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning and an earthquake. What a picture of prayer. What a picture that John must have just stood back in awe as a man of prayer for many years. You say, well, Pastor, I'd like to be special like that so that when I pray, it's fire falling from heaven. Well, I want to tell you, you really are just that special. Notice twice, he says, it's the prayers of all. Everybody shout all. all. It's the prayers of all the saints. And then he says it again, the prayer of the saints. Saints are not dead people in heaven who, while they were on earth, did some miraculous work for God. But saints are all of us who have had the work of God applied to our lives, the blood of the Lamb that sets us apart as His very own special people. As a matter of fact, the Bible says in 1 Peter 2, 9, He says, You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's very own special people, that you should show forth the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. Now, John sees and writes how effective and powerful because it's like fire being hurled down to heaven and there's peals of thunder, thundering, there's rumblings and flashes of lightning and earthquake. And John sees how effective and powerful the prayers of all God's people are throughout time and throughout history. He's not just talking about just during the tribulation period even though that very much applies to this passage. Now, some Bible commentators believe when he says another angel, some Bible commentators believe that that is the Lord Jesus Christ because angel means messenger. And if you read the first couple of verses of Revelation chapter 8, he talks about seven angels having seven trumpets. But he says another angel is acting as an intercessor with a golden censer with the incense and uh, that incense with the prayers of God's people uh, is offered upon the golden altar and God moves. I want to tell you Jesus is our one and only great high priest and he ever lives to make intercession for you and I this morning in this service and in our lives. He's, go, he's given that golden censer filled with incense and it represents our prayers that, that are like incense there before the Lord. Now the golden censer and the golden altar was in the earthly tabernacle. It was in the earthly temple that would come later. Uh, and, and you know, you remember in that tabernacle there was the outer court that had the brazen altar and the laver and then you walked in and only the priest could go inside the holy place and there were three pieces of furniture there was the golden lampstand there was the table of showbread but right in front of the veil of the holy of holies behind that veil where the ark of the covenant was that was symbolic of the presence of God there was the altar of incense it was a golden altar and the fire on that altar was never to go out and we know that throughout Scripture that the altar of incense represents prayer. 
As a matter of fact, when you read in Luke chapter 1, the priest Zechariah in the New Testament was given that special assignment. I can't imagine how overjoyed Zechariah was when he got a turn, because there's a lot of priests and they didn't all uh, necessarily get, get to go every other week. You know what I mean? And he got this, it fell his turn that he was able to go to the temple. And it was his job in the temple to offer incense before the Lord. And while he was offering incense in the holy place, the Bible says the people were standing outside praying. It was the time of prayer. And, and the incense and the prayers were going up. And that's when Gabriel came to Zechariah. And he said, I just want you to know that your and Elizabeth's prayers have been heard and they have been answered. And we're going to give you a miracle baby. You're to give his name uh, John, and we see that it was at that altar of incense of praying that miracles and signs and wonders and what we think is impossible, nothing is impossible with God. David said in Psalm 141 and 2, he said, May my prayers be set before you as incense and my, the lifting of my hands as the evening sacrifice. But I want us to get the connection here this morning because when we pray, our prayers rise up before God and the God of heaven hears and he answers with fire falling from heaven. As the prayers rise, the fire falls. Amen. And my prayer this morning is let the fire fall. Let the fire fall in my heart. Let the fire fall in our nation let the fire fall in our church and notice when our prayers rise and the fire falls that it is in heaven that our prayers are kept it's there at the throne of god before the golden altar and the throne i want to tell you some of the answers we need will never come from this world I thank God that he gave us a brain and he created us in his image and he gave us creativity and he gave us all these wonderful things that we can do and our ingenuities and our intellect, it all comes from him. But I want to tell you, there's some things that this world cannot do that we need to hear from heaven above that can only be accomplished. He said, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. Our land needs a healing today in the presence and power of God Almighty. And if we'll pray, fire will fall from heaven. Amen. Fire will fall. You know, that fire in Scripture represents the effectiveness of the working of God in our lives, on our behalf. It results in changed lives, miracles, signs, wonders, healings, provision, protection, the fire of God. It's, it's a symbol of the working of the Holy Spirit in our lives and in our world. Matter of fact, when John the Baptist introduced Jesus the Messiah and we read in Matthew 3.11 that John said, I indeed baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes the one who is mightier than I am. I'm not even worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you in the Holy Spirit and with fire. Jesus makes a, an amazing statement. You know, it's kind of one of those statements from Jesus that makes you go, hmm, I want to check that out. In Luke 12 and 49, he said, I have come to send a fire on the earth, and I wish it was, I would that it were already kindled. Well, when I get through giving you some scriptures here, and hopefully this message will get a full understanding of what Jesus meant by that statement. The early church sure knew about that fire from heaven because Jesus told them to wait in the city of Jerusalem until they were clothed upon the power from on high. And the Bible says as that 120 disciples were waiting on the promise of the Holy Spirit, Acts 2 and 2, that they were praying and suddenly there came from heaven a sound. Where did it come from? From heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled all the house where there was, they were sitting and there appeared uh, to them uh, 
cloven tongues, we call it in the old King James, what appeared to be tongues of fire, and it sat upon each of them. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with tongues. Paul writes to us, 1 Thessalonians 5, 19, he said, don't put out the Spirit's fire. Let's don't, let's don't limit the Holy Spirit, what he can do in our lives, in our church, in our neighborhood, in our lost loved ones. Because Hebrews 12 and 29 says, our God is a consuming fire. You know, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7, kind of sang about that in the refiner course this morning. He said, the sufferings that come to you, he said, he said, when those sufferings come, he said, they come as a way that our faith, being much more precious than gold, which perishes, though it is tried by fire, may be proved genuine to bring praise and honor and glory at the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and, and Peter has said, those fiery trials, he calls them in another place in 1 Peter, has come to refine you in your life. And then when you say good night to history as we know it down here in 2 Peter 3 and 10, he writes that the Lord is coming like a thief in the night wherein the elements, the heavenlies are going to burn with fervent heat and everything that's in the earth is going to burn up. Then he says in verse 13, but according to his promise, we look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness. Amen. Let the fire fall. And God is saying to us and every one of us this morning, I want us to get to that place that we understand that this fire that I'm preaching about, that John saw, brings that purity. It brings power. It brings energy from the Holy Spirit in our lives. And John saw that in the prayers of all God's people, bringing fire from heaven. We live in a generation who need Fire falling from heaven. We live in a generation who need the purity and the power, the, a revival to turn the hearts of people back to the Lord. Oh, let's yearn for it. Let's pray and believe the Lord for it because it brings about the greatest needs that we have before us today, the fire. I want to lift up three powerful truths about our prayers as fire this morning. And the first one is this, the value of prayer. I want you to note this passage of scripture, the value God places on prayer. And we need to value prayer. What a gift. What an opportunity the Lord gives us. He puts an inestimable worth on the prayers of his people. And you and I, we, we need to value prayer in our life. As you look again at, at Revelation 8 3, I'm not going to read it again, but you'll notice that, that he puts that incense and that golden censer, and it's, it's placed on the golden altar as it rises before the throne of God, you know, in the fact that it is golden. You know, gold is still uh, the standard. We call it the gold standard, do we not? And God had his people to overlay that furniture with gold because God, there's things that God values and prayer is one of those things that God values so much. And the fact that they are kept in heaven you know, when you value something, you're going to protect it. Now, there's some things, there's just a couple of things that Kim and I have in our house that, that we have in a very special, secure, safe place. Your prayers this morning are in a very secure and safe place. They're with God the Father in heaven, amen, because he values every tear you shed in prayer, every groan that you give, every request that you make, every misunderstanding that you, that you have in your heart and mind and you don't know how to deal with it, God places those great, that such great value on our prayer, prayers and God has heard your every prayer. He values them. You know, just think about how we ought to value that. Just 
Pray, what is prayer? Prayer was well, a relationship. Prayer is communing with the Lord. What, what a, have you ever just wanted to sit and talk to somebody important? Well, you can. When we come to God in prayer, just sit and talk to him. Somebody asked me the other day, said, you know, how do I pray? I said, just, just pray like you're talking to someone, your best friend, and just pour out your heart and let them know everything that's on your heart. It ought to be valuable to us as we trust him. And he, he places value on it as we trust him and give him every concern and need and desire of our hearts. When Jesus came to this earth, God in the flesh, he valued prayer. You know, as the Messiah, God in the flesh, he taught us that in this veil of humanity that he put on for us, the value of prayer. Think about it. The Word made flesh. The Messiah, the King of kings and Lord of lords praying. Yet he is saying to us in this veil of humanity that I wear and that you wear, you've got to value prayer in your life. Martin Luther, the great reformer, said, you can as easily live without prayer as you can breathe without air. It ought to be. That ought, ought to be what prayer really is in our hearts and in our minds and in our lives. And Jesus had such a communication with the Father, such a community, such a relationship that the disciples saw it. And, uh, and, and they, they were amazed at his prayer life. You know, Mark's Gospel, chapter 1 and verse 35 said that he rose up early before it was daylight and prayed. Mark 6 and 46 says that he prayed while it was uh, getting into the evening hours. Luke 5 and 16 said that he prayed in lonely places. Sometimes we need that solitude before God. We need to turn off the television and the, and the, uh, the Spotify and whatever that we've got going on and just be silent before the Lord and pray just to hear his voice. In Luke 6 and 12, he prayed all night before he chose his disciples. In Luke 9 and 18, it said that he prayed uh, uh, in private and his disciples would see how he would go alone and pray. In uh, Luke 2 and 22, he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, not my will, but your will be done. And he prayed three times, therefore hours agonizing for you and me in his prayer. In John 17 and 1, in the upper room before he went to Gethsemane, uh, the Bible says that the disciples heard that great prayer of John 17. It's, it's such a wonderful prayer. The whole chapter is the prayer of God. And, and he said, uh, Father, glorify your Son on earth that I may glorify you. And he begins to pray for all of us as well as the disciples. He prayed from the cross. Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. He prayed from the cross into your hands, Father. I commit my spirit and thank God he prayed from the cross. It is finished. Amen. Yeah. The disciples saw his prayer life. It was an amazing thing. And one day they came to Jesus and they said, Lord, teach us to pray. They didn't say, Lord, teach us to preach or heal or deliver. They said, Lord, out of all the things they could have asked him to teach them. They said, Lord, teach us to pray because they saw the connection between Jesus' prayer life with the Father, his time with the Father, and the power and working of God. And I tell you that if we're going to see that connection, we've got to see fire fall from heaven and it's going to come as the result of a fervent prayer life before the Lord. Amen? And they saw that. That's an interesting request by them. They were, grew up in Judaism, going to the synagogues. Man, they heard prayers every Sabbath and they were taught the prayers, but there was something about Jesus' prayer life, you see. It wasn't like what they heard in the synagogue. It, it wasn't from a prayer book uh, that they just memorized. Those prayers were good, but they just memorized and they just recited them without thinking sometimes they were lifeless, they were spiritless. And, and they saw in Jesus there was something 
differently, uh, different about his prayer life. It wasn't a, a ritualistic prayer, but it was as though that he was in direct communication and, and connection, just like uh, John saw it here in Revelation 8. There was, there was, uh, there was interconnection between the prayers rising and the fire falling. Many people this morning, they're praying in churches and synagogues and mosques all over this world. They're praying at shrines, reciting their mantras, ritualistically wrote, hoping that some God somewhere will hear and answer. But when you and I pray, we pray according to how Jesus taught us to pray. And through the Holy Spirit, who is our intercessor, something is going to happen and it's going to change in our lives and in our loved ones and in our world. How many of you believe that? And when they said, Lord, teach us to pray, what did he say? He said, this is the way you're to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Jesus taught them this, and he teaches us this, that prayer is relationship. Our Father in heaven. He teaches us that prayer is reverence. Hallowed be your name. He teaches us that prayer is resignation to the will of God. Your kingdom come, not my kingdom. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He teaches us that prayer is requesting from God. Our Father, give us this day our daily bread. He teaches us that prayer is reconciliation with others. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. He teaches us that prayer is resistance to the temptation of sin and evil. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. He teaches us that prayer is rejoicing for yours is the kingdom, yours is the power, and yours is the glory forever and forever. Amen. I don't know what you are facing, but as we face changing times daily, it seems like it's changing rapidly. As you face the stress or, or maybe the difficulties in your marriage or, or in your children, I want to tell you, let's face them saying, yours is the kingdom. Yours is the power and yours is the glory. Let's face our times of challenge in our times of opportunity in our times of sometimes impossibility to us that's possible always with God let's face it by understanding that we can rejoice because our God is sovereign and he is in control if you believe that he's in control in this world right now that looks out of control it's not in his estimation let's give him praise I want to rejoice in him amen amen that's how we face it. That's how you and I can rejoice when the world is wondering what in this world has happened to them. Because his is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Let's value prayer. Let's value prayer like, like the Lord valued prayer. <laughs> Let's give prayer that importance. Once again in our lives, is this not basic in our lives? Let's give prayer a priority. I like to say it this way. Pray first. Pray before you go to the doctor. Pray before you call the doctor. Pray before you hit send on that email to get somebody a message. Uh, pray first. And when we pray, and we have to ask ourselves, you know, is prayer my steering wheel in this journey of life or is it my spare tire? And I only just pull it out, you know, when I need it. It's like the fishing captain that uh, had his crew on the boat in a great storm. It's just obvious that the fishing vessel is going to go down. And uh, he's getting everybody ready. And he said, how many of you believe in the power of prayer? And one guy said, I believe in the power of prayer. He said, good. He said, uh, there's one life jacket that's short. 
So, you, you know, I don't know. Sometimes we pray as a last resort. You mean it's come to that? I've got to pray? Well, let's make it a priority. Let's value it. Because when you pray, pray, God hears and God keeps your prayers and God answers your prayer and God acts on your prayer. And the second thing is the vindication of prayer and, uh, you know, the context of this passage, the context of this scripture on prayer. That, that it's just before God is about to unleash judgment on this world that we call the tribulation. So stay with me here. Because, you know, it, it requires us to think about this in our own life, how we pray. And uh, Revelation chapter 6, verses 9 through 11, you will, when the Lamb of God opens that fifth seal, you hear the prayer of the martyrs. You hear the cries of the martyrs. How long, Lord? And the Lord gives them a white robe and said, just a little longer until all of your brothers and your sisters have paid the price for their word. The Bible says for their testimony of Jesus Christ and the word of God. I want to tell you across the world, people are being persecuted, put in prison, losing their financial means. Some put to death. Some put in prison camps for their faith. There is coming a day when every injustice will be rectified. There's coming a day when every evil will be brought to judgment. There's coming a day when all suffering from unfair treatment and slander and accusation will be made right by the judge who alone, who alone has the right to judge righteously. Jesus, thank God, how many of you are glad of this? He took the judgment for your sins and mine on that cross. And when you put your faith and trust in him, you are justified, the Bible says, by faith in Christ. And your sin debt has written across it in the blood of Jesus, paid in full. How many of you like to get those notices in the mail? Paid in full. But judgment is coming. And I'm glad that I've trusted in the one that's already took my judgment. But here's the point. Regardless of what you've gone through, regardless of if people have said things about you, I'm not talking about somebody just spoke a little cross to you. You know, we get our feelings on our sleeve and get them hurt. But I'm talking about accusation and I'm talking about condemnation and judgment brought against you. And I want us to remember this morning that God's going to vindicate every person who falsely accused or hurt you or mistreated you in this world. As a matter of fact, I like the way Isaiah puts this. And I, go, I could go to a lot of scriptures on vindication this morning. And, and by the way, great is the a mystery of godliness. Uh, Paul writes to Timothy that, uh, you know, Christ, uh, God came in the flesh. You know, he died for us. And just quoting that one passage that's correct, he said he was vindicated by the Spirit when Jesus was mocked on that cross and they said he saved others. He can't even save himself. I want to tell you, on that third day, the Spirit of God vindicated Jesus that he's King of kings, Lord of lords, Savior of us all. Amen. But Isaiah said it this way. In Isaiah 54 and verse 17, he says, No weapon that is fashioned against you shall succeed, and you shall refute every tongue that rises against you in judgment. Now watch this. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord and their vindication from me, not declares Wayne Merritt or Isaiah, but declares the Lord. Amen? So what you and I, what, what do we do when we're, what do we do when we're treated unjustly? Well, let me give you a few things. It's not on the screen, but you can remember these because we know it's in our heart. We know it's in the Word. <laughs> how, do you, how, do you read, how do you get to that place that, that you can just handle 
when people's lied on you or talked about you unjustly, tried to bring hurt to your family. Well, first of all, you love your enemies. You bless those that curse you, do good to those that, that despitefully use you, and you pray for those that mistreat you. I preached that last week. The second thing is you don't retaliate. When I'm talking about vindication, I'm not even talking praying vindication. I'm not even I, I, praying retaliation, rather. You know, Paul, when he talks to us in Romans 12 about about our worship to God as he opens up. Then he talks about our gifts and the body of Christ. Then he talks about how to love each other. He said, Repay no one evil for evil. It's in Romans chapter 12, verse 17. He said, don't do that. He said, when you are mistreated, do good to those who mistreat you. And he says, it, it's like, when you do that, it's like coals of fire being placed on their head. Now, what does that mean? One guy says, yeah, I prayed for my enemy and I hope God burns his brains out. That's not what that means. <laughs> Coals of fire was the best thing you could give some people in that time. I mean, fire was a very important commodity. But God's vengeance is mine. I will repay. And so what we have to do, we love our enemies, keep our hearts pure, Put, and here's the, here's, the, here's the thing that we need. Put everything that's ever happened to you, let it go. Put it in the hands of God and let him vindicate and, and, and call out in your life that you really meant it for good. Amen? You know, it's amazing to me how often Jesus connects forgiveness and prayer in the Lord's Prayer. But then, you know, we, we talk about the great passage in Mark's Gospel 11 when Jesus said, if you've got faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say to this mountain, be removed, cast into the sea. And if you don't doubt in your heart, but believe those things that you, that you say shall come to pass, you will have whatever you say. Then he said, when you stand praying, be, and praying, believe that you receive those things that you have prayed for and you shall have them. Then he said, and when you stand praying, if you have ought against anyone, you forgive. Because when you forgive, your heavenly Father will forgive you. And that's what I mean. we got to put it in the hands of the Lord. Well, how should I pray then, Pastor, uh, in this prayer of vindication? If I'm a part of that, if my life is a part of that, and God's going to vindicate you or me for any injustice that might have happened to you for righteousness sake in your life. Here's the first thing, and this is, these are not on the screen, but you can remember them. First of all, you, you need to pray in intercession. If I'm going to keep my heart pure and I'm not going to repay evil for evil, and I'm not going to avenge as God told me not to because vengeance is his. He will repay. He knows, only God can do it righteously, you see. Only God is the true judge. And only God knows all things, you know. And, uh, and, and what you and I need to do is start praying for them. Billy Graham said it's impossible to pray for somebody and hate them at the same time when you really pray. I don't know where you've come from. I don't know what's happened to you. I don't know what people did to you if that happened to you. But think about Abraham when the Lord came to him and told him that he was going to destroy the cities of God, God, Sodom and Gomorrah. He was going to bring judgment on those cities. And what did Abraham start doing? Genesis 18, he started praying. He started interceding for, for the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. He said, Lord... Would you destroy the city for 50 righteous people in that city? And, and he kept on interceding. He kept on interceding for 40 and, and 30. And, and, and you got it down according to Genesis chapter 19. Uh, he so interceded that he got it down to the very family of his own. Now, you know, Abraham could have said, serve Lot right. You know, he over there greedy, greedily looked down there at those plains of lush plains of Sodom and Gomorrah and saw how fertile it was and when I gave him the choice he chose that because he was so greedy serves him right to be down there he could have said that if he was an unrighteous man if he didn't have compassion in his heart but Abraham prayed the Bible says in Genesis 19 until Lot was rescued 
out of Sodom. Everybody's not going to believe our prayers. I think about Moses. You know, how the, the people of God that he was trying to help and lead, how that so many times they would come against God. They would, they would challenge him and his leadership. But putting all that aside, when they make that golden calf and God said, get out of my way, I'm going to destroy him. God was testing Moses. God knew what he was going to do. God was testing Moses to see if he would intercede. You know what God said? He said, I'll destroy him. Now get this. I'll make of you, Moses, a brand new nation. Some of this selfish praying that we hear about. What did, what did Moses pray? In Exodus chapter 32 and verse 32, he said, Lord, forgive the sins of your people. There's a, there's a line there. Nobody know, knows what that line means, but then he said, or blot my name out of the book of life. Wow. Now that's heavy. That's heavy intercession. You know, sometimes that's, that's the way we want to treat people. Don't, don't ever give up on, don't ever give up on anybody. Pray for them. Intercede for them. Samuel, when the nation rejected him as their judge and as, as their prophet. They rejected him and they wanted a king. And, 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 and so God said, go ahead and give it to them, Samuel. And they got their first king, Saul. And then the people realized what a great mistake they had made. And they came, they came to Samuel. They were so afraid that God was going to judge them. And, and Samuel, uh, in short, just simply said to him, 1 Samuel 12 and 23, as for me, God forbid that I would sin against the Lord for failing to pray for you. But the greatest intercession we've ever seen was on that cross. You think about Jesus. He was called a, a glutton. He was called a wine bibber. He, he was accused of, of demon possession and blaspheming the Holy Spirit when they did it. He went through, and even while he was on the cross, they were mocking him and, and ridiculing him from the government to the religious world. And there he was, but he was interceding. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You know, as you and I, as we intercede, we need to remember him. We need to remember Romans 8 and 34. Who is he that condemns? It is God who justifies. And it is Christ that died for us. And it is him that was raised from the dead. Whoever lives to make intercession for us. And Jesus is at that golden throne interceding for you every time you pray. The Bible says in Hebrews 7 and 25, we have a high priest who ever lives. He's able to help us because he ever lives to make intercession for us. But while we're on earth, you don't know what you ought to pray for as you ought. Romans 8, 26 says, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groans that cannot be uttered. And the one that searches the hearts, he knows what is the mind of the Spirit because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. My point is this. How do we really, when we get into this vindication that's going on here in Revelation chapter 8, and believe me, that our prayers are a part of that because he judges righteously. But the point is this. Let us. And I, you know, I thought about this, and, and, and maybe I can't back this up, but did you know there's going to be people getting saved in the tribulation period? And as those prayers are going up in Revelation 8, the Holy Spirit's going to be moving. The Holy Spirit's going to be moving for, for, through those 144,000 Jews and others that are here that knows the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't ever stop praying. And I'd say the second way that you pray in this prayer of vindication is importunity. What in this word we don't use much, but what in the world is praying intercession, but praying importunity? What does that mean? That means that you are persistent even to the point of annoyance. Don't give up. You know, Jesus, look at it on the screen. Luke's Gospel, chapter 18, and verse 1. Jesus wanted to teach his disciples and us how to pray. This prayer of importunity, and he told his disciples a parable. Notice it's a parable. 
to show them that they should always pray and not give up, persevere, persist. And he said there was this one who needed vindication and the judge was not treating her case with fairness and righteousness. And she went to his house and she'd follow him every day to the courthouse. And she would say, give me what is mine. Give me what is mine. And that judge, he just would shake his head and walk off. But one day he said, this woman is going to worry me slap to death. So he gave her what she was asking for. Jesus said, do you hear that unjust judge? The unjust judge. This is not a, par a parable of comparison. This is a parable of contrast. He said, did you hear that unjust judge? Look at it. In verse 36, uh, I'm sorry, verses 7 and 8, he said, he said, will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones? Vindication. Whether it's in this life or the life to come, who cry out to him day and night, will he keep putting them off? He's not like the unjust judge. No, he's the father. He said, I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Will he find faithful people praying in faith and believing? Amen. Because there's vindication. He sees every sparrow that falls. He said, every hair of your head is numbered. He says, you're worth more than many sparrows. I'm telling you this morning that God will give to us everything that's rightfully ours if we'll pray and not give up. Pray and keep on praying. Ask and keep on asking. Seek and keep on seeking. Knock and keep on knocking. First Thessalonians 5 and 17. Pray without ceasing. And you and I pray and understand. We put it in the hands of God. We put people in the hands of God. And he vindicates us in righteousness. And the last thing is the victory. The victory of prayer. You know, the, the book of Revelation teaches us that Jesus Christ is king. He's coming back on that white horse. Every eye's going to see him and every knee's going to bow. Every tongue's going to confess. And we're coming with him. And that means that Jesus is Lord and we win. Amen? And this prayer, when you see the peals of thunder and the rumblings and the flashes of lightning and you see the earthquake, it helps us to understand the great power of God that comes in our lives. The victory that is ours when we go into spiritual warfare really is in our prayer life. And Paul tells us in Ephesians 6, he tells us that, he, he tells us in verse 10, he, he first of all starts off, he says, that, that we are to, to live in the power and trust in the power of God. In our lives. And he says, put on the whole armor of God. That you can stand against the wiles of the devil. And then he told, tells us who our real enemy is. Our real enemy is the accuser of the brethren that I just got through preaching about in vindication. He is the real accuser. And, and he says, you can stand against him. And having done all to stand, you stand this way and you put on that armor. But look at it. And what he says to us, or think about it in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 18. He says, pray. He says, pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. We've got enough praying in the flesh. We've got enough praying selfishly. We've got enough praying religiously. He said, pray in the Spirit with this in mind. Be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. When you and I pray, we get the victory. When you and I pray, fire falls from heaven. When we pray like Jesus taught us to pray, we pray in the Spirit. That great story in 1 Kings chapter 18, that great story, when Elijah faced the very forces of darkness through Baal, through Jezebel, and all of those prophets that she brought in. Y'all remember that? 
She was a heathen and a pagan and brought them to Israel and they had altars all over Israel and they were killing the prophets of God and famine came for three and a half years because of the judgment of God to bring them back to have revival to turn the people back to God. And God said this to Elijah, I want you to have a showdown. We're going to see who is the God of power in Israel. They controlled the rain, they said, Baal, the fertility of the earth and the rain, which obviously they were no gods at all. And he said, let's have a showdown. It had been for three and a half years. He said, but I'm going to bring the fire before I bring the rain. And I want to tell you, the fire of God always brings the rain. It always brings the blessing. It always brings the refreshing. It always brings about a great purging and purity and power and revival in the Lord. Amen? And the scripture says that Elijah gave them that opportunity. They could build their altar to Baal. They could go first. They could offer their sacrifice. And you remember that great story. And all day long, from that early morning, they cut themselves according to their religious rituals. They cried out to Baal, and Elijah got to making fun of them. And he said, why don't you cry a little louder? Maybe your God is dead. Or maybe he's gone to the bathroom, some scholars said, believe that he said. Maybe he's on vacation. Maybe he's taking a trip. Uh, just cut yourself a little more. And after all of that, Elijah, he built the altar of God back. And when he built the altar of God back, he put the sacrifice on it. He poured the water over and over and over again to show the power of God. Watch this. He prays, according to the King James, 63 words. Yes, there's time for all night prayer. But I want to tell you, it's not in how many times in a day you pray. It's not in how many words you say. Jesus said we're not heard by our much speaking but he prayed a 63-word prayer of faith in the Spirit of God, believing God, knowing that God hears from heaven. And the Bible says, look at it in 1 Kings chapter 18 and about verse 36. The Bible says, then the fire of the Lord fell. Do you need fire in your situation? Do you need fire in your life? Do you need fire in your family? Do you need fire in your church? Well, then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood and stone and the soil and also licked up the water in the trench. And watch this. This is the purpose. When all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, The Lord, Jehovah, He is God, the Lord, He is God. This is the kind of fire we need to see falling in our families, in our church, in Vidalia, in Toombs County, in this world today. We need to pray and the fire will fall from heaven. Amen? I believe that. So, Pastor, I don't no, I believe God. And I believe that fire is falling from heaven when you and I really, really pray. James is going to, he's going to bring up Elijah. He's going to bring up old Elijah before he ends his book and his prayer life in James chapter 5. And I want you to notice it, verse 16. James chapter 5 and verse 16. Look at it with me. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. The Greek words there, I want, you to, I want you to get that really deep in your spirit. And we're going to go to the Lord in prayer. James 5 and 16. The prayer of a righteous man or woman is powerful and effective. The Greek there is kind of, there, there's different there's different interpretations, but you know what it really means? It's that word powerful and effective. It means it's got some fire in it. It means it's got some energy. That's what that fire means. You know, it's time that you and I understand that when we pray in the Spirit, it, you know, Paul said, I'm working with all the working that I have from the Spirit of the living God in my life. And it's not us in our energy and our fervor that's working in our lives, but it is God at work in our lives. And when we pray, the fire falls. And God's on the throne. He's hearing and he's answering. Stand with me, please. Father, 
I pray that we would get to that place in our lives that the fire of God will be evident just like it was on the day of Pentecost, just like it was in Elijah's day, just like it was in James' prayer, that the fire of God will fall in our church, in our family, in our community, and in our lives personally. And I'll thank you for that. And I'll praise you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to close out this service. I don't know. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what you've been asking God for, but I, I just want to remind you, when your prayers rise before God, the fire falls. How many of you believe that? When your prayers rise, the fire falls. What do you need to see in your family? Don't ever give up praying for your family, your children. Don't ever give up praying for your nation. Don't ever give up praying for your church, your spouse, your marriage. Don't ever give up praying for your dreams. Keep on praying. Believe the Lord that your prayers are rising and, and the intercessor of our souls, Jesus Christ, will send the answer. He'll send the miracle. He'll send the sign or the wonder that you need in your life. I'm going to ask you to join me. You can kneel. You can stand. You can pray where you are, obviously. But I want us to come before the Lord around the altar today before the praise team leads us in a chorus. And I want us to just call out to God this morning and believe that some fire is going to start falling in our lives. Fire is going to fall in our church before the praise team sings for us. We're, going to, we're just going to spend just that time just believing God this morning, calling out to God right where you are, right where you're standing. Those of you that are watching online, Just right where you are, build an altar. Because I want to tell you, there's a golden altar in heaven that's got the fire of God on it. And the, uh, the, the prayer of a person that's been made righteous in Christ. The prayer of the people that have pure motives, not selfish motives. Praying, my will, your will be done, Lord. You know, prayer is not trying to get God's will our will done on earth, but it's trying to, it's praying to get God's will on earth from heaven. Your will be done. Your will, but your will be done. Let's pray together. Father, I just lift up before your people today, family members, situations in their lives, God, sicknesses and diseases. Just lay my hands on your people, asking you to touch. Lord, asking you to move, asking you, God, to minister. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Father, God, bring it about. We pray for the fire to fall in our families today, fire to fall in our homes, in our neighborhoods. Our children, our grandchildren, need you to touch God in our lives. Bring healing, bring your touch, bring your strength today, Lord. Today, in the name of Jesus, save and save. They have a see it's because it's like fire shut up in their bones, as Jeremiah said. He said, I tried not to preach. And Lord, that work that you've called us to do, our children to do, may we like shut up in a Strengthen your people. Church, believe with for revival today. Hallelujah. I don't know about you, but the, the greatest thing that I can have as a parent is to know that my children and my grandchildren know the Lord. The greatest thing that I can have is to know that they want the will of God more than they want anything else in their life because when we, you and I, have the will of God, we have everything added to us that we need. When we seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, would you just lift up your children right now? 
Would you lift up your children and your grandchildren? I'm not afraid of this world. I'm not afraid of what's going on. I'm telling you, there's a fire falling from heaven. Hallelujah. There's a revival that's coming that's going to shake this world from one end to the other. Yes, there may be a great falling away, but this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all nations. The testimony. Hallelujah. Oh. Amen. Amen and amen. Don't, don't count, sell God short. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Fire fall in my children. Fire fall in my grandchildren. Fire fall in my church, Father. Hallelujah. 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 We bless you, God. We praise you, God. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. God said, I don't want you to be cold. Or I don't want you to be hot. I think God prefers either. How many of you like it cold or hot? But he said, because you're lukewarm, I can't stand that old humid, humid weather. God said, because you're lukewarm, I'll spew out of my mouth. I want to see some red hot fire in my own life this morning and in our church and in our people. Father, we receive it today. We believe it today. We trust you for it today. Church, right now, agree with me. Agree with me after you pray for your children. Fire fall in Vidalia Church. Let's say it together. Fire fall in Vidalia Church. Say it again. Fire fall in Vidalia Church. When they had prayed, the place where they were assembled was shaken together. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen. And they spoke the word of God with boldness. Hallelujah. I'm not taking a back seat in Toombs County and Vidalia. We are the people of God and we belong in the service of the Lord to make a difference. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, just lift your hands and give him praise. Would you just give him praise? Lord, we need a revival. We need to see people's hearts turn back to you. We need to see the lukewarm get on fire for you. Hallelujah. Those that are cold, they know they're cold. They know they need Jesus. Lord, let them see the warmth and the light and the power that they can live in your presence and in your love and in your goodness. Oh, Jesus, grant it, I pray. In the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. I feel the Holy Spirit in this place. Church, I'm just going to ask you to agree with me. And those of you that are watching online, I hope that this is more than just a sermon that we heard on Sunday morning. But would you join me this week? And I'm going to try to put out some prayer points this week on Facebook and just try to get them out. And those of you that are not on Facebook, I'll try to get them to 